right. I'm going to do something that you have, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever heard me do this before. I'm going to preach from the lectionary. Um, one of the readings for this morning is what we call the third servant song in Isaiah. So 50th chapter of Isaiah verses 4 to 9. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with the word him that is weary. Morning by morning he wakens, he wakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been confounded. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. We all know what yesterday was the 20th anniversary of. Was I the, was I the only one who didn't feel up to endlessly reliving it? No, you're not. No. Um, One of my favorite episodes from the old uh, TV series, Seventh Heaven, was, an, it was, I think, a second season episode where, the, well, it, well, Seventh Heaven dealt with the pastor at a community church and his then five, later seven children. And the, the youngest child, a girl, was having a fight with her mother. And uh, the, young, the youngest kid was about five at the time. And her next, older, her next older brother was in a class. He was going into what is nowadays called middle school. And... He had to do an oral history project. And now, Ollie, if you, were my, if you were my age, which is about five times your current age, the overworked question for such projects was, you ask your parents, where were they when they heard about President Kennedy being shot? That's, that's what everybody fell back on if they couldn't remember anything else, couldn't think of anything else to do. Well, in this case, the next youngest kid named Simon, you know, is going around with his father on some of his rounds. He goes uh, to a woman, an older Jewish lady who lives in the neighborhood and he sees numbers tattooed on her forearm. And his father forbids him to bother her about that because the father knows what that means. And eventually the episode ends with the actress who, who was a Holocaust survivor recounting a story drawn from the memoirs of another Holocaust survivor about her first day in Auschwitz. You know, very, you know, very heady, powerful stuff. And 
you know, the question for the next 30 years is going to be when, you know, kids, you know, bother their parents or grandparents, where were they when they heard about September 11th? Well, I know where I was. I was at work. And when I heard the news, at first I thought it was an accident. You know, that, you know they overworked pilots so badly and air traffic controllers so badly that somebody had strayed a plane into a building. I mean, tragic still, but understandable. And it was soon apparent that it wasn't anywhere near that benign. And I remember going home that night and you know we had the evening news on and you know the air traffic ban over the entire country had been announced and you know and Joyce was sitting on my bed next to me and we heard a helicopter go overhead you know it was very vivid very scary and since you know this past monday at sundown started young started rosh hashanah so it's now the jewish year 5782 And there is, you know, in Judaism, there is a tradition about, about taking the first 10 days of the year between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and making amends. So that on Yom Kippur, you stand in front of God with a clean slate. And what does all of this have to do with the third servant song in Isaiah. You, you're probably wondering at this point. That was, a, that was an especially powerful passage for me the year I was in England. You know, in 1984 to 1985. And the Quaker meeting that I attended only had unprogrammed so you know i grew up in kernersville meeting you might think that some of the silences we have here can be a little on the cursory side in kernersville when i was growing up if you if you had more than two or three minutes of silence people started fidgeting and you could hear them it was the loudest one of the loudest silences i have ever heard so i, I had to you learn gradually what to do. And in the course of that, you know, I did a lot of what pretty much all the adults will recognize or at least get a good idea about if I use the phrase inner work. And that, and the, the passage from this morning's reading was very precious to me and it's you know I mean it dates from probably between five you know sometime in the 540 BCE decade so 550 to about 540 Cyrus the Great is consolidating the Persian Empire just over the border you know in fact the same writer eventually calls refers to Cyrus as thus say, you know thus says the Lord to his Messiah to Cyrus so Cyrus is you know is called Messiah and why is Cyrus called the Messiah at least in this situation because the Jewish community 
was in exile in, in the Babylonian Empire, around Babylon. And it, towards the end of what we would call 539 BCE, Cyrus captures Babylon without too much of a fight and brings the empire of the Babylonians to an end. And Cyrus, who, who basically establishes the ancient Persian empire, sets up a policy that works very well for them for quite a while, but eventually becomes part of their undoing, which is Cyrus lets all the people that the Babylonians had carried captive go home if they wanted to. They could go back to their homelands. They could set up their commonwealths again. They could rebuild their places of worship. You know, all they had to do was to be good citizens of his empire. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, it's almost you know, modern liberal American type thinking. You know, you know, he didn't get the Persians very deeply involved in nation building. He released nationals from various nations the Babylonians had carried to their capital and let them go back and reestablish their nations as part of his empire. And the figure that is speaking in this passage is a shadowy figure called the servant of the Lord, the Eved Yahweh. And a lot of scholarly ink and sermon ink has been spilled on the question of who it was. In Christian, standard Christian theology, the answer is pretty much Jesus one note. It's clear from the servant passage immediately before this, though, that the writer, whoever she was, and I believe it was probably a woman, and she was, she was a genius of the first rank, that she meant the servant as a metaphor for the people of Israel. And that, you know, that the experience of Israel, they had been humiliated, they had been driven from the land that they thought had been promised to them by God. That was their understanding. Their temple and their capital were in ruins. Their royal line had been deposed and taken into captivity along with them. But what, but what does this figure say? For the Lord God helps me. I mean, you know, I, I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to those who pulled out the hair. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. The Jewish people are some of the greatest survivors in history. The Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks and the Romans, various, you know, various uh, local groups in the European Middle Ages, most tragically the Germans, you know, the Russians under the Tsars, the Germans under Hitler, all tried to wipe them out and failed. And maybe it's you know having you know having that for the Lord God helps me, therefore I have set my face like a flint, therefore I know I shall not be confounded. He who vindicates me is near. I 
I know that kind of moment. Probably others of you do too. When you think you are at the end of your rope and then all of a sudden you realize that God is there with you. And that whatever happens, it's going to be okay. It's not going to be how you thought it was, but it will be okay. I remember the spirit that was abroad in this country just after 9-11. You know, the spirit of 9-12. You know, we were all, we all pulled together. We had the sympathy of the entire world just about. We let ourselves be knocked out of that place through fear and trying to control the world. Piece of Spanish news. Controlling the world is a bigger job than anybody ever imagines when they try to do it. Life will always throw things at you. If it's not, you know, if it's not COVID, if it's not a terrorist attack, if it's not an economic downturn where you lose your job, you know, nobody, nobody is guaranteed a hundred percent trouble-free ride. Nobody. I mean, some people are able to cushion themselves a lot better than the rest of us because they have, you know, various resources that soften the blow, but nobody just about gets a free ride. Maybe the spirit that we all need to recapture is the spirit of 912. Now that we now that we've had our day of breast beating and mourning for what happened to us 20 years ago. We got out we finally got out of Afghanistan as a country. There are things that we need to work on. So let's do the work. Let's pull together. Let's do the work. And let us know, let us be aware that it's rather like the surprise twist in a very difficult movie to watch, in extremely loud and incredibly close. You know, where the, kid, where the kid has lost his father in one of the Twin Towers. But he thinks his father has left him a message. You know, you know, a quest to fulfill, you know, which was to find the owner of this key that he comes across. And so he sets himself the task of finding everybody, of visiting everybody who ha, who is of the right last, you know, correct last name that's written on the small envelope that the key is in, in the entire five boroughs of New York City. You know, he plans out the quest, he goes, and eventually he comes to the end of it and finds out that getting the key back wasn't really the quest. And what he finds, low battery, okay. What he finds is that his mother has gone before him, smoothing the way for him. The way God goes before us, smoothing our way. The Lord God helps us. Amen.